Atheist Nomads, episode 117. Interview with Dr. Daryl Ray. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low price, full featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A R C H W A Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash atheist nomads. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo haws. Please be advised. <laughs> We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Hey there. And joining us once again is Dr. Daryl Ray. Good to be on, guys. Oh, man, it's been a while. Yeah, it really has. It was episode 18. Oh, my gosh, really? Yeah. So it's almost been 100 episodes. Holy shit. Wow. Well, okay. We'll try to make up for lost time here. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, for, for a little bit about Dr. Ray, he is the founder of Recovering from Religion, author of four books, two on organizational team issues, as well as The God Virus and Sex and God. He is the host of the Secular sexuality podcast, a uh, psychologist for over 30 years, and all around just awesome guy. And a, and a dude that knows how to put on a party. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like to party. If life's not worth partying for, then it's probably not worth it. So let's, let's party. <laughs> Fucking hey. <laughs> yeah, just just to let everybody know. We'll we'll have to let everybody know the details of the party so they can start planning for next year. Oh hey. <laughs> All right. So yeah, it's been a while, but you know what? I've heard that you got some really fresh stuff that you've been talking about. And I'm sorry, but I've just been wanting to talk about these Duggars for a while. So <laughs> <laughs> uh I heard you got some an, an interesting perspective on them, let's say. Oh, where did you hear this? Who who are you talking to? Uh, this was Can from. Can you reveal your sources? I, nah, 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 no, sir. <laughs> uh, is this something you're allowed to talk about, or oh. have you take the lid off it yet? No, nah, go for it. Well, well, by all means, no, you should <laughs> step up, sir. <laughs> oh, you want me to talk about it? I thought you Just had go. questions for me. Well, give give us an overview, and then we'll start questioning because you know, I think everybody's familiar with. The, the Duggars to a certain extent, right? between well, Josh and his sisters or the family in general. Yeah, I gave a talk last uh, Sunday at our local Oasis meeting, and uh, the title of it was uh, What the Duggars Can Teach Us About Human Sexuality, which was a somewhat misleading title. I lie sometimes, and I did that time, because the Duggars really can't teach us shit about sexuality, except as a negative example, which they do very, very well. So that's mm -hmm. kind of focused on... Uh, with with some caveats and actually with some sympathy, I have some sympathy for the Duggars, as as we can talk about if you, if you want to. But uh, I I looked at the Duggars as a as an example of what's wrong with fundamentalism and their their psychology. I talk in my talk, and, and people can go to Oasis um, Network and just Google my talk, and they'll come right up. But if in, in my talk, I talk about du the Duggars as being. Um, having a fundamentalist psychology. And people really don't think about there being any other kind of psychology than the kind that you go to a psychologist to see or a counselor or, or what's published in professional papers. But indeed, fundamentalists do have a psychology. It's not scientific, but it's a psychology. And the psychology is that uh, you're, is, is, run, is run through spirit, the spirituality stuff and run through their theology and run through their view of uh, creationism you know, the notion that their psychology, the notion that women are are um, tainted and, and are broken from the very beginning. We're all broken, according to them. But mm -hmm. when, you, when you understand, when you start understanding that their worldview is really, really consistent and it has a psychology to it. It's not just willy-nilly. It's not random. 
and from an outsider's perspective, we think, well, those bunch of hypocrites out there, but but really, there there's not even a there's not even hypocrisy. Once you understand the, the Duggar point of view, the quiverful, the you know the fundamentalist kind of uh, a view worldview, then it makes makes perfect sense. For for example, a lot of people say, well, how 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 about that? You know, the Duggar he's such a hypocrite. Well, what we're seeing in action right now is what we saw with say Ted Haggard, what we saw o- over the years with uh, Jimmy and Tammy Baker. I mean, all these scandals that took place is they have in, within their psychology they have something called a forgiveness ticket. And once you've fucked up bad enough, you get you know you have to resign, you have to leave, you have to stop doing whatever you're doing for a while. You have to go to Jesus rehab in some in some form. And then when you get through Jesus rehab, you get your forgiveness ticket punched, and that lets you back into the club. And that's what's happening. We we see, for example, in Franklin Graham, the guy was, you know, a biker and a sinner and all sorts of stuff. And but but he finally repented, went through forgiveness, whatever he ended up doing, and Billy Graham's son. And now he's one of the top assholes in the world with, with respect <laughs> to us, with our from our view, worldview. From their worldview, Jesus has forgiven him. And and you can get unlimited numbers, you know, forgive 70 times seven is what Jesus himself said. So they will forgive their own over and over again. And there's a couple caveats here. One is you get it, it, the younger you are, the easier it is to get forgiveness without a lot of um, shenanigans. The more powerful you are, the more you have to get your ticket punched and the more things you have to do. I mean, Josh Duggar, I will guarantee you two years from now, he'll be back on the evangelical circuit and he'll be doing his thing. Yeah, Bristol Palin is out there, has been campaigning against uh, premarital sex and and absent and, you know, advocating absence only. But she she got her forgiveness ticket punched after the first out of wedlock baby and got back in the good graces of everybody. She's young, though. She did it again and she got her forgiveness ticket punched again. In many cases, all you have to say if you're young is, oh, I've I've asked for Jesus to forgive me and, and now I'm forgiven. Now, when you get as powerful as somebody like Josh Duggar or Ted Haggard, you have to go through a lot more hoops to get back into the club. But we have to think of this as in-group, out-group behavior in, in terms of our kind of psychology, scientific psychology, is there simply there – you are still part of the in-group. You're just kind of put on the side. You're, you're, you're put out temporarily, and if you'll just go get your forgiveness ticket punched, you can get back in. So Josh goes to sex addiction counseling, for example. That's what his dad did for him, sent him off to that um, uh, retired uh, Arkansas state trooper. And for six months, he builds houses with the guy under the guise of getting sex addiction treatment. Well, <laughs> if you heard anything about from my talks, you know, there's no such thing as sex addiction. And Josh Douglas certainly is not a sex addict, but he got treatment from this <laughs> this trooper with oh, no training. If you can call that treatment. Well, it is treatment. Don't now see that's where you're going wrong. You need to understand about Jesus here. <laughs> you don't know Jesus. Jesus forgave Josh Duggar, and that it took him six months to forgive Josh Duggar. But once he was forgiven, then he can get his he got his ticket punched, and he's back in, and he's back in from molesting his five women, five girls, so four of his sisters, and somebody outside the family. So you, and of course, nobody says anything about the damage done to the girls because. Again, within their psychology, girls are second – women and girls are second-class citizens. Uh, and uh, when a girl sins, especially sexually, a sexual sin among females is far greater than a sexual sin among males because males are the dominant ma- mm-hmm. males. So Josh Duggar will get his ticket punch. He'll get back in. You know, he if he had just done the um, – what was it? the Back in May when they this all broke – He'd be preaching again by now. He'd be he might have had a position back with the Family Institute. Who knows? <laughs> the trouble is, he was also on Ashley Madison and some other dating sites. So he's <laughs> going to have to go. So what he has to do now is that you know they try to push him into this Christian sex addiction treatment, and that treatment is pretty long. It, it can go up to a year. It looks to me like I've read um, when I looked at their site, and uh, there's not a single. Uh, qualified counselor in there. I'm curious. Uh, mm. From what I've heard, 
Uh, last last heard is that he hasn't even reported to that place. That's true. That's true. But before before that, I went and researched it and I was looking because this is where they're sending Christians right and left. Yeah. They go pay thousands and thousands of dollars to get treatment. Now, if you look at their treatment, it's mostly prayer and Bible reading. <laughs> And that's yeah. what passes for treatment. And the most – the counselor's qualifications are they were a, a, a heroin addict as recently as three years ago or two years ago. They were a sex addict, but the Jesus has saved them. And what, right. quali- what qualifies them for counseling, to be a counselor, is that they have been filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, it's a part of their psychology. Someone that's filled with the Holy Spirit – has the power within their own Bible to heal other people and to read other people's spirituality and help them recover from the evil, the demons that possess them or have influenced them in some way. Well, one thing I saw growing up in the Adventist church was the quote unquote worse you were, then the the faster people will accept you and the higher the praise they will give you. Right, right. Like I, I knew kids that, that they... You know, grew up in Adventist homes, were wayward teens, and did tons and tons of drugs, and you know, got a couple women pregnant, and then turned eighteen. Is like, oh, I'm not doing that anymore. Study theology, and have no trouble getting hired as a pastor. Yeah, right. Because they they were reformed. Right, getting right. God, and have, so they'd have a testimony to tell. And you'll notice it's all males. You, you don't hear those stories quite as often from females. Because females aren't even allowed to preach, so you're not going to see that for sure. But the women that got pregnant, how are they treated in those same churches? The girls yeah. that he got them pregnant, are they shunned? Oftentimes, they get them getting back into the fold is really, really difficult because they had a child out of wedlock. Now, fortunately, what I saw in the Adventist church is that they'd usually kind of get the cold shoulder while pregnant. And then once the baby was born, everything was all fine and dandy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. But they're not going to get any – well, of course, they can never get positions of leadership. And, and there's always the question, until until they get married. Now, when they get married to a man and maybe have other children with that man, they will also then become um, candidates for martyrdom in the sense that uh, – well, the males will – in the sense that, oh, this male took on the baby of another man, so mm-hmm. he's kind of a martyr. He's – He's stepped up and he's following Jesus better. She never gets credit for raising the kid as much as the guy does because he's sacrificing himself. I mean, that's all a part of their theology and psychology. That, and, but in each case, you see, it always it always gravitates toward males getting more credit, males getting preference within that whole system. Definitely. <laughs> in my talk, I talk about a whole system of abuse and sexual misbehavior that just surrounds this whole family of Jim Bob and Michelle Duggar. And I just have the hardest time saying that word, Jim Bob. It just <laughs> sounds like it came from a Southern reality show, doesn't it? Well, and yeah. uh, you're, you're in uh, Missouri, right? I'm in Kansas. Kansas. Oh, you're in Kansas. Kansas. Okay, so you're, you're Kansas two states. Kansas. Kansas City on the Kansas side. Oh, okay, so you're two states away from them. Uh, yeah, Arkansas is, yeah. Yeah. True, yeah. So so within well, what, that framework. What did they really teach us besides, well, missionary position? That's the only thing you're supposed to be using. You didn't know that? Damn it, I'm fucking it up already. <laughs> <laughs> you, you need to go back to church to learn something. <laughs> <laughs> well, around the, around this whole network is, is Bill Gothard, who's like the god of uh, homeschooling, and he got caught abusing the young interns in his office. You get this huge organization that's supplying all these homeschoolers, Christian homeschoolers around the country. And people noticed he always seemed to have the prettiest interns. And turns out, yeah, he's he's abusing them, molesting them, and all sorts of stuff. Well, he had to resign over all that. But this is one of the top people in the nation. And then you got, of course, Josh Doug we've talked about. And then you got Doug Phillips of Vision Forum. And uh, Vision Forum has been around and very influential and they're very close to the Duggars. And, and it turns out Doug Phillips is uh, having an affair with the nanny. You know, he's diddling the nanny when he shouldn't have been diddling anybody except his wife, according to their, now I'm not, I don't care who he diddles, but according to their theology, he, he's done that. And so he's had to resign. 
these are all people connected. And of course, this jo- Joseph Hutchins that went off to uh, war that the Josh Duggar got sent to retired um, state trooper got caught in a child pornography ring, and now he's spending fifty six years in jail. So these are all people that that are very very influential in in the movement, the fundamentalist this homeschool movement. And you got to ask the question: if it doesn't work for the top people in the whole movement, who does it work for? And my contention is everybody in that system, no matter what rank or level, probably is having some kind of problem. That it's just it's just rampant. This the for example, the sexual abuse. I'm guessing and guaranteeing there's a lot more sexual abuse among those homeschool Goth Gil <laughs> Gothard groups. And you've got yeah, depression, you got mental illness. I mean, there's a lot of things that's coming out of this. Hey, Daryl, have you heard of uh, Pastor John Piper? Oh, unfortunately, yeah, that guy. Yeah, his recent thing that sex is for Christians. Yeah, that everybody <laughs> else is prostitutes. Yeah, it's just great. I used to use a clip of his in one of my talks. I'd, I'd use like a three-minute clip. That show, I mean, the guy's a nut. He's an idiot. And I'd, I'd use this clip. Well, I, 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 I was using it in my talks about primate behavior. Uh, when I give my talk on um, evolution, sex and evolution, I call it sexy evolution, what the Pope doesn't know about sexuality. <laughs> Any Pope, not just the one we're talking about today, have today. And I was, so I was, I was using that, and one, I was saying, now, these megachurch ministers are the alpha males of that particular group, and they have groupies around them. I mean, if you look at who attends church— 70 to 80% of people in any church at any given time are females. Males don't attend church near as much as females do. Um, and that varies. It does vary according to, well, there's some categories that changes a bit. But so you look at that and you say, and then you look at who's doing the work in the church. It's women. And who are volunteering in jobs that would get them close to the alpha male. It's almost always women. So you get these alpha males who have all this opportunity and I'm saying, now this guy's an alpha male among all these. And a couple women came up to me after my talk, and they, they spoke the truth in such a clear way. You said, Daryl, you say he's an alpha male. And both of them said, I would never sleep with that guy. He's a, he's a jerk. And I said, well, that's kind of my point. But <laughs> they don't want to sleep with him because he doesn't look like an alpha male to them. But their mistake is they're not looking at from inside their psych- the psychology of his group. Mm-hmm. He is yeah. the alpha male within that worldview. He's oh, sure. the top dog. And and when we don't understand that, we think he's a hypocrite, but he, he's not. He, even if he's screwing half a dozen women in this church, he's still not a hypocrite. Even if he gets caught screwing them, uh, he's, he's just been led astray by the devil. Satan tempted him. If he gets his forgiveness ticket punched, he'll probably be back in six months or a year. I saw it when I was growing up. We had a we had a minister who got caught three times over the course of ten years. He got caught three times screwing screwing members of his church. Now here's my contention: If you're smart enough to run a big one of the biggest church in the whole community, this is Wichita, Kansas, you're probably smart enough not to get caught. He only got caught three times. So how many more times did he do it? And he never got caught. <laughs> these these guys are really slick, and you know, just because it's the first time, you don't think Ted. That's the first time Ted Haggard ever had sex with a male prostitute when he, he got caught once. But he'd been doing it. You know, he'd been doing it a lot. Oh yeah. Well, and one thing I learned in my ministerial studies is women in the church will give pastors plenty of opportunities. Oh, they will. We we did this. I don't know if you've seen our research. We did <clears throat> about three years ago on sex and secularism. And uh, what 14,560 secularists told us about their sex lives. I don't know if you've seen that research. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a free download on, online. We published it. But what we, we had, we asked people a lot of questions. We've got tons and tons of interesting information about nobody had ever asked atheists about their sex lives. Nobody. And that was really fun. That was really interesting stuff. But we also gave people an opportunity to say lots of, make lots of uh, textual comments in the research. And one guy said, and this just characterizes what you just said. He said, I used to be able to lay every girl in the Sunday school class. When I became an atheist, none of them will talk to me. (laughs) Now, isn't that interesting? So sex is forbidden. Sex is something you're not supposed to be doing. But it's very easy if you're part of the club. 
Mm-hmm. If you're not part of the club, you're not allowed to have sex. And lots of churches, of course, Catholics say don't marry a Protestant. Protestants say don't marry a Muslim. Muslims say don't marry a, um, Eastern Orthodox. You know, you can't marry outside of your your religion. And you can't even marry across it sometimes. Catholic, I mean, Baptists are discouraged from marrying Methodists because Methodists obviously don't know anything about the real gospel and stuff like that. Damn, ain't that true. <laughs> It, it, it causes some serious problems, too. You look at Zoroastrians. They're yeah. isolated. They will not marry outside of their, their own religion. And yeah. their genetic pool has just been shrinking. It is, and getting more incestuous, for sure. There's only about a quarter of a million in the whole world, and they're mostly India. The ones that are still in Iraq or, or, or Iran are, are been driven out. Iran's the place it all started. Now they don't exist there hardly anymore. And they're starting to see some serious birth defect issues. Yes, just like the Sephardic Jews are. There's there's a number of religious communities like the Amish that are seeing the same thing. You get you get too much inbreeding, it just really causes genetic issues. Yeah. Wow, we got way off topic there, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. We're going to take a quick break, and then uh, we will get back on topic after that. <laughs> we love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com, tweet us at atheistnomads, Send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Atheist Nomads. Or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. Yeah, I want to bring this back around to something you, you mentioned earlier, and that was the amount of people in these inner circles that have, you know, they're... they're having all kinds of scandals and also you mentioned uh, a lot of mental illness. Yeah. That was something I saw in especially the more conservative Adventist communities that I would occasionally encounter. Seemed like the more conservative, the higher the rate of mental illness Mm -hmm. and the worst things they would do. People who were acting out sane and weren't having any trouble living their ideal life didn't really seem to be drawn to the more extreme forms. Yeah. I write in my God, my book, The God Virus, that kind of explains that because I think what religion is very good at is, is, is creating a pathway for that attracts a certain, certain issues, certain kinds of people, certain kinds of personalities. And so if your personality – well, think about it in terms of, of just a cold virus – I mean, how many times, If let's say you live in a, f- a household of five people, how many times do two of the people get a cold and nobody else does? Or three of the people get the flu and, no, and the other two don't? It's because those two that didn't get it must have some kind of immunity. They're certainly close enough. They've certainly been exposed to the virus. So you get the example of people getting a disease in the same household that other people don't get the disease. Religion is the same way. You're... you're personality is susceptible to certain religious appeals and other that person right next to you may be your brother sister or parent or whatever is not as susceptible to those religious appeals just just like a virus it can't get into your body because you've got the antibodies well some people almost seem to be born with the antibodies against certain viruses and some people seem to be born with the antibodies against certain religions i mean i don't know how many times i've had people say i knew this stuff was a bunch of bullshit since I was nine years old. I, and, and, and yeah, well, there you go. I was go. more yeah. 13, but yeah. 13. Well, you beat me by like 35 years. I, <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't finally figure this all out until I was in my mid thirties. And I think I'm bright enough to figure it out, but, but I was infected. And when you, you get infected early enough with this stuff, you, you don't know you're infected. You just go right along with the program. And that's, that's what I see. Now, if that infection gets in you and then you've also got a tendency towards depression or you've got a tendency towards bipolar or, you, or anxiety disorder, that religion is going to take advantage of that. That's why the notion of eternal damnation, eternal hell is so traumatic. And I do mean the word traumatic as in post-traumatic stress syndrome. So traumatic to people who have a tendency towards anxiety. The religion just takes a hold of that tendency and takes advantage of it. One of the biggest things I see in people leaving a religion is 
I've been an atheist. People say I've been an atheist for five years and I'm still waking up in cold sweats about going to hell. And I don't even believe in hell. I don't even believe in God. Well, it's kind of like when you were two years old, you, you were learning, you were learning your, the, your native language. And at the same time, you're learning the language of religion as well. Mm-hmm. Maybe nobody's teaching you you're going to hell too, but you know it, you hear it. Maybe nobody's telling you masturbation is wrong, but you figured that out pretty early. And I've asked people over and over again in my own podcast, how did you know you were doing something wrong as, in masturbating? And they say, I didn't know. I just knew it was wrong when I was nine years old or I was 10 years old. So what happens is you're absorbing these things. You never stop and think, why isn't my mom or dad teaching me Chinese? Why are they teaching me English? You don't think in those terms. And you get, so to speak, you get infected with it with your language and you get infected with other notions at that age and religion is just right there to infect you with that now some some infections are pathological and that's what religion is it it takes advantage of whatever tendencies you've got and that's why we're seeing i think so much uh, mental illness i i have interviewed certainly dozens of people if not hundreds of people in my lifetime hundreds and thousands one of the interesting things that um, pa- patterns I've seen is when people when people are in religion they they're experiencing depression they may be being told by their ministry you need to pray harder you know that sort of thing or go to some kind of religious treatment or if they're a little more enlightened they may go to a psychiatrist and get meds but they're still in their religion I've had so many people say within six months after I got out of religion I no longer needed my meds wow that's quite a statement right there that really now, is. <laughs> we need to acknowledge that religion wasn't the cause, but religion exacerbates and teaches. If you've been taught since you're, if you have a normal, natural, almost genetic tendency, maybe towards anxiety, uh, anxiety, then if we just put a little anxiety um, enhancer, let's call it fear of hell, in your life from the time you're one or two or three years old. Then is it any wonder that you need meds by the time you're 15, 16, 17 years old? And you may need them for years. Once you get out and stop feeding that fear of hell, you can get off the meds. You know, don't get off your meds just because you left religion, by the way. Don't don't do that. Go to make sure your psychiatrist says to get off the meds. I've just seen a pattern about that. There's those four really powerful words though. What if I'm wrong? You know, when it when it comes to hell or or belief, lack of belief. And, you know, that hell is a horrible, horrible thing for a lot of people. It is. Yeah. It's really difficult to shake because it was put in there. It's it's like shingles and um, measles. You know, if you, if you get measles <laughs> at two or three years old, that virus stays in your body the rest of your life. You've always got measles, so to speak. And it can express itself again in the in the form of shingles when you're an adult. And we see that hidden. It literally hides in your body. And, and that's what you see in, in uh, people who are afraid of hell as atheists, is they were infected so damn early, they don't even know what's in there. And this notion is still hiding. And they have to actively work to overcome it. And that's, what I, that, that's why I'm so strong about making sure people get some counseling or therapy or at least go to a recovering from religion group or something. You need to talk this stuff out. Because you do not know how much of this shit's actually still influencing you. Mm-hmm. Part of the reason I started my podcast, Secular Sexuality Podcast, is I saw so many atheists still being afraid to masturbate or admit they use pornography, you know, or or talk or afraid to talk to their partner about their sexual fantasies. If you're a secularist, there's no damn reason in the world why you shouldn't be able to do all those things. And yet I know a lot of atheists that are still sexually uptight, really uptight, as uptight as any Protestant. Well, why? They don't believe in this God anymore, but they still have the God virus inside them. That's scary. They need to get their freak on. And they haven't challenged (laughs) those ideas. Yeah. Well, for for an interesting uh, comparison with, you know, Adventists don't have a belief in, in a hell, but they do terrify people with the time of trouble. Yeah, right. The the apocalypse coming. Yeah. And I was reading through the news about the Pope's uh, recent visit, and there was a part of me that popped up and said, wait a minute, this is all supposed to happen before the time of trouble. <laughs> because in the, the Adventist eschatology, you have uh, the U.S. government and the Pope working together 
to enact a national Sunday law. Yeah. And then the Pope gets, and the U.S. work to get the entire world to enact a, a Sunday law. And, you know, since the establishment of the U.N., that's what people have thought would be the, the agency used to make that happen. And then the Pope speaks to Congress and then the U.N. Mm-hmm. Sorry, quick definitions. Uh, the Sunday? Just Seventh day admins only meet on Saturday. Right. So Sunday so this, law would be to force people to go to church on Sunday. Right. And would uh, make it so that you okay. cannot buy or sell goods if you don't. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so go, to, go to church on Sunday plus blue laws. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and that would definitely terrorize uh, Seventh days. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because of Saturday. Okay. But just Fair the enough. fact that the Pope talked to Congress and the UN. It, it brought a little bit of that crazy Adventist conspiratorial thinking to mind. Yeah, that's a that's a, a great example, Dustin. And everybody listening to this podcast has got some of that shit inside them. And I want I want to help people challenge those notions so they can get beyond that. There's once you realize I, so many people have told me there's so many so much of my worldview changed. I mean, I bet this is true for both of you. I when I was. When I was giving my talk about the Duggars the other day, I said, "How?" I asked to the group, it was you know 150 people or so in the in the audience. I said, "How many of you experienced a dramatic change in your worldview and your perceptions of the world when you left religion?" And every, I would say, virtually every hand went up there in the room, so that when they when they left, no matter what their religion, their perceptions of the world changed dramatically. And it wasn't just switching from creationism to evolution. There's a lot of other things, you know, about I could admit I'm I'm gay, for example, or I could admit I'm uh, whatever. But what I'm finding is, yeah, uh, let's say that 80 percent of those perceptual notions that were embedded in you got challenged. But there's still 20 percent that haven't. And it could be a lot more than 20 percent. And we as seculars need to get good at challenging those in ourselves. That That's a large lot, largely why I think there's a lot of continuing mental illness issues in the secular community. Oftentimes I, I did a, I did a workshop in my home for just, you know, for people that wanted to come here in Kansas city and all secularists. And we, we kind of looked at those issues and I guarantee you everyone in that room found boatloads of internal ideas and assumptions. They're all atheists, right? They're sitting in my living room, 10 or 15 of them. And we're just looking and examining our internal assumptions about the world, and we're finding boatloads of shit that they still believe. And they didn't. They didn't until you, they came in my house, sat down, and I started challenging some of those ideas. It's not easy. Just just because you left religion doesn't mean it. religion is out of you. <laughs> you mm-hmm. can leave religion, but it still stays in you. And that's what your illustration was. Uh, oh, and, yeah, and even if you, like I went through a, five or six year process of forcing myself to rethink everything. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I still miss stuff. <laughs> yeah. And and you I know. guarantee you, you will for years. <laughs> and, and just, but even if you take a systematic approach, you're probably still going to be influenced, but I do encourage you to take a systematic approach. And by that, I mean, sometimes it means go find a counselor, sit down and spend two or three sessions You'll be amazed. Just tell them up front. I want to start. I want to start finding the assumptions that I I took out of religion and still still influence me that I'm not aware of. If you just tell a counselor that, uh, any decently trained counselor who is also secular, by the way, make sure they're secular, will be able to help you find dozens of notions and ideas that are still influencing you. You know, I I called myself an atheist when I was about 13, but I didn't tell my mother till I was about 16. Yeah. But you know, it, it took me a long time to outgrow the racist and other horrible stereotypes that come yeah. along with my mother and, and our religion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So well, yeah, that's been a, that's been a, like the, the, the atheist part, that was easy. Everything else has been a long road. <laughs> well, we get notions about, not just sexuality, but about gender relations and, and the gender binary. I mean, I know atheists that are still very uncomfortable with with transsexual people. They just can't understand that. They don't doesn't compute with them. Well, there's no reason for that unless you're still infected with some kind of religious God virus, still infected with some notions about 
you know, there's only male and there's only female. They don't understand the spectrum of, of there, gender. There is also just, I, I think a certain aspect of it is the way language shapes our, our thinking. Yes. We have two gendered pronouns. Yes. True. And the, well, we have a, a non-gendered pronoun as well, singular pronoun. Yes. But it implies inanimate object. Yes, right. And language can shape so much of everybody's thinking. And so it's very easy to just kind of default to, well, if you aren't a he or a she, you must be an it. Yeah. Well, no, at I least that's, no, that's, I, well, no, that's the case for all of the uh, former chiefs in my government office. If you're not a he or a she, you must be an it. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. They're kind well, of assholes. I wasn't in the Navy, so I didn't know that. All right. <laughs> I've learned something about the Navy now. Okay. Chiefs, chiefs and it's all right. <laughs> I, I, I'm thinking that was a joke, but I don't think it was. It really didn't sound. <laughs> Not really a joke. Yeah, no. no I, okay. uh, I have the, the funny Christian, you know, like 180 degrees from my desk. I look back and I see a foot and a half by four foot <laughs> sign that says he is risen oh. in our in our government office. I see. Yeah. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're honest, good people, salt of the earth, all that. Yeah. But you couldn't put a, he has risen ph phallic symbol up there or anything. <laughs> <laughs> if you like this show, consider giving us some financial support to make it really easy with one time donations or to support us on a per episode monthly or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon. Find out more at atheistnomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. One dollar an episode is all we ask. Please think of the kittens. So you, you've mentioned uh, sex addiction therapy that, that Josh Duggar is supposed to be going through and the horrible credentials and also that it doesn't exist. Right. Uh, so it's pretty commonly accepted throughout our culture that it is a thing. Uh huh. Um, yeah. So why is it not? Well, it was pretty commonly accepted in our culture that there were demons for thousands of years <laughs> too. You know, just because the culture accepts something doesn't mean there's any scientific evidence for it. There are lots of people who still believe in ghosts and that wine water turns into wine when you take it. And Jesus, you're eating Jesus when you go to the mass and stuff. There's there's lots of crazy ideas, but that doesn't mean just because the culture says it. So here's the deal. If you're going to be a, if you're going to be in the business of psychotherapy, if you're going to be in the business of psychology of helping people, you need uh, scientifically validated criteria in order to make a diagnosis. It's actually no different than your doctor. You go into the doctor, you say, doc, I've been having trouble sleeping and I, I, I need to get better night's sleep. I don't know what's going wrong. He says, and he looks at you and says, well, you've got a demon problem here. Let's deal with your demons. <laughs> You'd probably, I mean, first of all, the insurance wouldn't cover that one, I don't think. Yeah, I don't think there's an ICD-10 code for, for demons. No, there wouldn't. And, and he, might, he or she, your doctor, might, might turn around and make a quick phone call to the mental health agency and say, I'm referring somebody to you. <laughs> <laughs> the, is they think they got it. So, or you, or you might do that to the doctor. I'm sorry. Yeah, you'd be the other way around. So yeah. that's basically what we've got here. We've got, there's, a, you don't wake up in the morning and feel bad and say, oh my gosh, I must have leukemia. You don't self-diagnose. You go to a trained professional. And, and when I say trained, I mean, they're actually trained in how to observe and measure in such a way that they can determine by using scientifically validated criteria whether you have leukemia or not. Maybe you just got some anemia today, or maybe you just didn't have your third cup of coffee yet. I don't know which it is, but you don't diagnose yourself. You go to a medical doctor who's gotten training in diagnostics. That's what a mental health professional should be doing. They should be using medically, uh, scientifically validated criteria. You, you don't have a sex addiction because there's no medically, there's no scientifically validated criteria for sex or porn addiction. We've been looking at this for 20 or 30 years. If you want the details, you can go look on YouTube and see my talk I did at Free OK in June uh, called the myth, mm. the myth of Sex Addiction. Or you can read uh, Dr. Marty Klein's great essay in the American Humanist magazine a couple of years ago. He 
the title of it was You Are Addicted to What? Question mark. Just Google that. You'll get his, his essay. <laughs> or you can read Dr. David uh, Lay's book, The Myth of Sex Addiction. It, these are all things that you can do some research on. But the bottom line is, and we all, all three of us are psychologists, and we're all saying the same thing. We have no criteria for, do, for identifying. It's a very subjective thing. So could you bill insurance for it? Okay, that's the, that's the very interesting question. If you are diagnosed with sex or porn addiction, there's no way to get an insurance payment for that. Those wow. places that are treating sex or porn addiction, yes, they will bill your insurance company, but they'll do one of two things or both. They will bill you for the meds and for the psychiatric services diagno- diagnosing depression. You know, you come in, you say, I've got a sex addiction, or they diagnose that. Then they turn around and they classify it as depression, and they bill the company for treatment uh, for depression. They also bill the company for the meds. That's billable. The trouble is that's not the diagnosis they told you. They told you you had a sex addiction. So mm-hmm. it's a bait and switch thing here. That's yeah. horribly unethical. It's very unethical, and there's lawsuits. Uh, Dr. David Lee's actually testified in court against uh, treatment centers for misrepresenting their treatment. They, <laughs> they treat the person for sex or porn addiction, but they report it as depression or anxiety uh, disorder or something like that. And this is going on all over the place. And, re- and insurance companies are getting wise to this because they don't want to be paying for a sham treatment. You can't treat somebody that something that you don't have a diagnosis for and you got scientific criteria for. Mm-hmm. So, and so the worst thing that's happening is a person goes in and says, you know, gets diagnosed as a sex addict. Yeah, they may be in billed as a depression, but they're not getting treatment for the depression. They're getting treatment for sex addiction. And there are tons and tons of sex addiction counselors out there and porn addiction counselors. They're very poorly qualified. They couldn't diagnose their their uh, 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 d- disorder if their life depended on it. But <laughs> there are certification programs. Brigham Young is probably almost ground zero for certification in sex addiction. The yeah, more but really big you, sex and porn addiction. If you mention Brigham Young, I mean that's already kind of suspect in my eyes. It is. It is. Yeah, BYU Idaho uh, in Rexburg, uh, uh, yeah. Rexburg, Idaho. Yeah. Yeah, that um, was me. Pretty much every girl there is very happy to do anal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that's for that's first date material right there. Love uh, uh fuck me in the ass, Jesus. Uh, uh fuck me in the ass. I love Jesus. You've seen that song, haven't you? Mhm. Uh, by the Garfunkel and yep. Oates or whatever their <laughs> names are. They're they're hilarious. They are. Yeah. And there's there's a lot of that stuff. So okay, so did that answer your sex addiction question? Um, part of it. The other part is, so there are obviously people who either can't live up to their commitments that they make and feel the need to get help with that, or who are actually engaging in dangerous or destructive behavior with their their sex lives. What are yeah. the actual issues there that are getting glossed over? Well, when I when I watch TV and I see uh, see uh, boxers and f- female fighters, um, isn't that pretty self destructive? Yeah. What's the difference? There are lots of people out there, football players, American football players, are engaging in pretty self destructive behaviors, just behaviors that are going to cost them physically for the rest of their life. So we got we have a lot of people out there that are engaging in. What appears to be self-destructive, even abusive behavior, but but there's no sex involved. The minute you put sex into it, something magic happens. Something magic changes. Do you see the mm-hmm. irony of that? Yeah. So we got all these people in lots and lots of professions. My, I've got an ex-father-in-law who who can hardly walk because of his knee problems from football. I, I should say, well, that's he's not really my ex-father, but anyway. He's he's a relative of mine, and he can't hardly walk because of knee problems he got in high school football. <laughs> now, and kids are still doing that today. It's not, and this guy's like in his sixties now, and he's been virtually crippled for thirty years. That's pretty serious, wouldn't you say? Mm-hmm. And oh yeah. How's that? How's that not as serious? How's being having a little extra sex here and there, watching more masturbate, more porn or whatever? Here's the deal. 
people do self-destructive things all the time. It may or may not be socially acceptable to those do those sexual self-destructive things. People say I masturbate too much or I I'm I'm a sex addict. Well, in most of the cases, who's doing the diagnosis here? It's almost always self-diagnosis or it's your spouse or your minister or your Sunday school teacher or your you know, somebody close to you uh, diagnosing you. None of them have any criteria for diagnosing, of course. Self-diagnosis and spousal diagnosis is really bad. <laughs> I call it the Oprah effect because <laughs> people get on Oprah and whatever Oprah says must be gospel truth. And it's, it's bullshit. Oprah is perpetuating a lot of this stuff. Oh, yeah. She's got so, way too much woo backing her. So up. here's the deal. Underneath that behavior may be depression. Underneath that behavior may be a bipolar disorder. Maybe underneath that might be uh, anxiety disorder. I don't know. But I do know for damn sure it's not porn or sex addiction. People act out their underlying um, emotional and mental health issues all the time. Mm-hmm. It, People who are out there flipping people off and yelling and screaming in their cars when somebody cuts them off, to me, that looks like a mental illness. And they're going nuts just because somebody supposedly cut them off. So that's acting out. What's going on underneath them? Why are they so easily upset about a mere traffic change of lane that they didn't signal? I've seen people go apeshit over that stuff. So there's – and do we say they're – car addicted or they're traffic addicted no nah, we we actually excuse that behavior i i don't but people excuse it and what i'm saying is that there's probably something underneath that they're not dealing with an anger issue they they don't know how to control their anger they don't they don't know how to relax they're they're working too much so they're depressed and they're acting their depression out who knows but yeah. it's not sex addiction it's not porn addiction yeah. it's traffic addiction um, None of that. how many alcoholics and people with or not alcoholics necessarily, but people's drinking problems or drug abuse issues are actually just self-medicating undiagnosed uh, mental health issues. Yeah, I, I, a lot. There's a lot there as well. Hmm. Also, I, I'm also very suspect of, of alcohol addiction. You know, there's a lot of iffiness about that. So it's pretty damn hard to diagnose uh, an alcohol addiction. So people say I'm an alcoholic a lot of times. How many times have people said I'm an alcoholic and it was really them self-diagnosing or their spouse diagnosing or their minister diagnosing or the judge or the judge diagnosing. It's not a diagnostic. It's not a diagnosis from a medical professional who's going through the checklist to see, do you meet all the checklists for alcohol addiction? Hmm. And even, even the checklist is pretty, you know, it's iffy. You got to be pretty careful about how you use it. So, I, I'm just, I've been on a tear recently about this whole sex and porn addiction thing because there's no atheist ought to be buying that kind of shit. There's none of it out there. We can't prove it. There's no diagnostic criteria. So, let's start talking about mental health. Let's start about anxiety disorder. We're talking about um, depression. Those are the real issues that we should be talking about, not not whether a person is self identified as a sex addict. So, then if you, you look, Look at a counselor's website and you see sex addiction on there. Uh, run, run, run. That's all I've got. <laughs> Advice. Get out of there. If they are a certified sex or porn addiction counselor, they don't know shit. Nice. I don't know if they got a PhD. That's why I started the Secular Therapy Project. I don't know if you're aware of that. Do you know about the Secular Therapy uh, Project? Uh, to, to look for a uh, secular. Right. We, yeah. we match up secular people with secular therapists. And we vet these therapists very carefully. In fact, if any of your listeners are therapists and you're not a part of our project, please get a hold of us. But we do make you through, jump through some hoops. You don't get into our pro- project until you've proven to us you're secular and you use evidence-based methods. No, no new age bullshit and woo-woo stuff. You got to use clinically proven, peer-reviewed type research methods within your within your practice. And we we've got 200 about 200 and almost 250 therapists in our network now and we've got over 6 almost 7000 clients in our network and they're seeking Damn. each other clients seeking therapists that are secular it is hard to find a secular counselor you don't know you can't look at their website and tell if they still believe that J- Jesus walks on water you know the, you can't look at their website and tell if 
they go to mass every Sunday and think that they're eating Jesus when they take take the communion. So what we do is we vet those people and they got to prove to us that they're they're secular. We don't require that they say they're atheists, but they do have to prove they're secular and we look very hard at you know whatever they might be unitarians. We've got a few unitarians. But you know unitarians are just atheist light usually. <laughs> mm-hmm. They don't usually think of ghosts and holy ghosts or anything like that. So you want to talk about kink too, right? Yeah, sure. Well, what are we talking about? What's what's your kink question of the day? Well, uh, what's your kink, by the way, Wesley? Well, definitely on the <laughs> definitely very DS. I'm the D. Okay. okay. Uh, but uh, toys. Uh, how are you? How are you on the toy uh, knowledge? Love them. Lots of All toys. Right. Toys. All right. Good. Like Hitachi toys. Hitachi is always awesome. Hot Hitachi. Uh, Every woman I've been with loves, almost every woman I've ever been with loves Hitachis. Yep. So, let's see. Hitachis, uh, tens units, um, violet wands. All the above, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, what's another couple of recommendations? Well, a good elk skin flogger. I have uh, many, many a lady likes the elk skin flogger I've got. Elk skin, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah, because elk skin is... It's not like deer. It's not like um, um, you know, cattle. You know, it's uh, leather. leather. It's it's very very soft, and you can really lay a, a good uh, flogging down with an elk skin flogger, and it almost it, it's got a thud to it, but not a pain to it, <laughs> and it, it does just simply doesn't leave mark. I don't care how strong you are, you can't hardly hurt anybody with it. And most of the people I've I've played I've played with over the years really seem to like that. Now I'm not saying it's the only thing I use, but but that's one of them. Yeah, with the increase in in domestic elk, um, those should become more uh, widely available. They, nice. they they might be. I don't know. I get them. I get them when I go to I I bought them when I went to a Spanksgiving in uh, St. Louis several years ago. I don't know if you know that convention, Spanksgiving. No, I sure don't. I would yeah, like every to. year they've got two conventions in St. Louis. One is in the fall before Thanksgiving. It's called Spanksgiving. And then the one in the <laughs> spring is called Beat Me in St. Louis. <laughs> there'll be there'll be five, six hundred people there and they'll buy an entire hotel for a long for a weekend. It's Very really nice. interesting. I what I find fascinating when I go to these conventions is how many religious people are walking around with cross cross neck necklaces, you know, and they're mm. Clearly religious, and I've met so many Baptists and so many Catholics at these things. And you just got to ask, how do they how do they resolve the you know cognitive dissonance between what they're doing here and what they do back home? You know, they're <laughs> almost always out of town. They there were I think they had seven or eight states represented the last time or two I've been there. People <laughs> coming in from Minnesota and South Dakota and Oklahoma for a St. Louis conference on BDSM. Not bad. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, another thing I really, really think is missing, and this is just Daryl's preferences. I, I think in the in the DS thing, I don't know. Do you do you engage in scenes? Do you like doing scenes? A, a little bit, yeah. Okay. Uh, we keep it private, though. But yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I don't go out on the street and do any most of uh, most of it. Yeah. But I mean, occasionally I've been to parties and all. But the thing I find missing is good music. And I think mm. I have really well, carefully selected playlists that I use. And then I let the playlist move me through the scene mm. and what toy I'm going to use at any given time, whether a you know a light paddle or a heavy paddle, a flogger, a vibrator, a clip, whatever, oh. anyway. Okay, well, that, that's and, an interesting and, and, and I use lots of classical music. I think classical music <laughs> is among the best. Now, there's other music I use, but it, Rachmaninoff is by far the best BDSM scene music on the planet, especially uh, especially his um, uh, piano concerto number two, the opening movement number one. It just it's just an amazing piece of music. And I don't, I don't know if I'm a big classical music nut, but I've had so many people say I've never even listened to classical music 
until I got in this scene and then that music just takes me somewhere. It really does. I don't know. You're familiar with subspace, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And your listeners may or may not be. But anyway, it just seems to help move people. Classical, at least these pieces have got a rhythm to them that is very, and I, t- I, tell, I tell the person I'm playing with to listen to the music, take a deep breath, breathe deeply, listen to music, stay focused in that way. It's almost a meditative activity. And it's just amazing how you can take people places they've never been before and uh, having orgasms they've never experienced before. And sub- subspace is definitely a, a very deep meditative state anyways. Yeah, it's an so, altered state of consciousness. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, yeah, that could, I, and I'm just, I'm looking up Sergei right now. So, piano concerto number two, huh? Piano concerto number two. Actually, his <laughs> uh, piano concerto number three is excellent as well. And his second symphony is excellent. Uh, I, mm. Just, and there's a lot of good, Rachmaninoff was an amazing composer. He has some really good stuff. I have got. I have two entire playlists with nothing but Rachmaninoff that I use in my, in my scenes. So, wow, I have never on a podcast talked this in this much detail. <laughs> <laughs> I would say you guys have got you've got some of my secrets now. You you should feel special. <laughs> no one has gone this detailed on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> hey, I, I could have a show just about this, honestly. Well, then let's come back and do that because I'd love doing it. <laughs> All right. I, I, assuming you want me to help you with it. but Oh, not. sure. Yeah. Um, I am quite <laughs> vanilla, so I would be pretty bored through the, <laughs> through pretty much the entire thing. You could just, you could, you could play my part. Well, then I, you're not I mean, usually make stupid jokes and laugh at stuff inanely <laughs> like I usually do. Well, here's the deal. The goal, at least as far as I'm concerned, the goal is great orgasms. Oh yeah. For whoever I'm playing with. And if they if they come out saying I've never had an orgasm like that and I had it ten times, then I think I've been successful. Oh yeah. yeah. That makes me feel pretty good. <laughs> you know, and and I am not, you know, like I'm vanilla, but I don't judge people who aren't. You better not, or I'll put you yeah. back in church. Yeah. Just like how I, I wouldn't want anybody who is kinky to be judgmental for me being vanilla. That's true. You know, hey, what, really whatever floats your boat. Well, just don't mess with our kinkiness. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously, whatever floats your boat. It's all good. All right. Well, I think we are out of time. So, Daryl, uh, what do you have to plug this time around? Well, I do want to plug my podcast, the Secular Sexuality Podcast, and listeners are going to be really interested in Monday. This Monday, Dr. Marty Klein is talking about pornography and i guarantee you've never heard this kind of talk about pornography before and then next week a week from this monday i'm talking to angela white a international porn star out of australia and you can go google her she 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 gets my tongue hard she's amazing (laughs) but the reason i'm talking to her is not because she's a great porn star in fact i'd never even heard of her until i went to australia a couple years ago and I met a woman named Fiona Patton. And Fiona is the head, and get this, she is the pres- head of the Australian Sex Party. This is like the Democrats or Republicans. It is a fully fledged, full fledged sex uh, party that's called the Sex Party. Hmm. And Fiona told me, I had supper with Fiona while I was there. She's also a leader in the secular community. She told me that we have, this is like 2012 or something, like was there. She says, we have a porn star running for parliament and i didn't know anything about her but i thought well that's pretty darn cool a porn star running for parliament in australia so i hadn't i hadn't thought about it until i a bunch of this porn star angela white's fans started emailing me and testing me and saying why don't you interview this woman so i started a researcher and i realized oh she's the one that was running for parliament when i was visiting i had to put two and two together and sure enough, I talked to Fiona the other day by email, and she said, yep, same person. So I'm going to be talking about the politics of pornography in Australia and running for parliament and being a porn star and, you know, just all that stuff. It just sounds fascinating. I've never on my podcast never had the opportunity to interview a porn star. And, and you know, I'll have all sorts of questions. I've actually challenged my listeners to send in some questions, and I'll choose one or two to ask her. Very nice. Very nice. 
Yeah, and then a few weeks after that, I'll be talking to two um, phone sex workers. They're they're going to actually come to my studio and sit down and talk to me face to face on what it's like to be a phone sex worker. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to guess really bored. Honestly, <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, we're going to find out. <laughs> oh man. But my goal and the reason I've even doing all this is obviously I want to normalize sex and sexuality, including people who choose to commercialize themselves. I mean, what's the difference between a phone sex worker or a porn worker and a football player that gets money for playing on Sunday morning for the Green Bay Packers? Mm-hmm. They're, yeah, they're, using, they're, they're using their body. And hell, I'm guessing that porn star will still have knees. And shoulders when she's finished with her career and can go on and do something else. Um, we'll still have a Angela brain. White's, Angela yeah. White's got a degree in gender studies from Melbourne University or something. She's she's no slouch. She's pretty damn intelligent. Probably smarter than some of those guys on the on the football field that are killing themselves. So I just think we need to stop um, slut shaming people for the for the choice of. Using their body however they damn well please. That's that's what I want to do. Well, you know, football players might have a lot of concussions and bad knees and such, but I'm guessing porn stars have a lot more throat injuries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I have no you, idea. I don't know if they're keeping statistics on that, but <laughs> throat injuries. <laughs> you gotta you gotta ask uh, Angela about that. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you what, I, I would love to know uh the the phone sex workers. I would love to know if how they describe themselves on the phone is how they actually look in real life. Yeah. Uh, okay. Send because, that question in to me. Yeah, I would. Yeah, because I'm I'm betting that they're feeding a fantasy, but I'd be really curious to know. Well, I've already talked to several in my career, and that's pretty much the answer. They're feeding a fantasy. They're whoever that person on the other line wants them to be. The that's that just goes with the territory. Yeah, now, with they, phone they, sex they, workers they don't advertise that. With phone sex workers, they're making a living off of their their minds, not their bodies. Actually, that's true. Yeah. That and the, the, thing, the thing about all three of these women is they're doing it very voluntarily and with great enthusiasm. They they love what they do. So yeah, you know, how can you condemn somebody for doing something that hurts no one? And it's all it's all just religious bullshit in our culture that condemns people for making those choices. Mm-hmm. All right. Anything new with uh, recovering from religion? Well, it's going great. We've got the hotline project. If people need somebody to talk to, they can call the hotline and and have a well trained person that can respond to just just talking to them. We're not there to convert or deconvert anybody. We're just there to help them. Uh, the secular therapist project is a big thing of mine, and that's we've already talked about that. And of course, I'd like your listeners to go read my books, Sex and God, How Religion Distorts Sexuality, and uh, my book, The God Bearers, because both of them, I think, will open your eyes about how things have infected you. I think I love Dawkins, I love Hitchens, Harris, and all them, but none of them go inside your own head, and none of them go inside and ask Okay, and how's all this affected you personally? And that's what I tried to do in both of those books. All right. Yep. Dr. Ray, all thank right. you very much for coming back on to, to Atheist Nomads. Thanks for having me. It's been a blast. And for our listeners, we'll be back at you next week with news. <laughs> Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads and like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Atheist Nomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. Theme music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been the Atheist Nomads. Atheist Nomads.